Welcome to the October 12th meeting of the Auburn Board of Selectmen. This meeting is being recorded uh, and is being streamed virtually. For those wishing to participate by computer, um, you can log in at global.gotomeeting.com slash join slash 235-235-861 or join by phone by dialing 1408-650-3123 with access code 235-235-861. Is there anyone else in the audience recording? Seeing none, can we sample? the to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, we have no public comments, no public hearings or presentations, no communications. Under Board of Selectmen general items, we have a presentation from the town clerk and reprinting for the op um, that requires the Auburn Select Board approval. The town clerk, uh, Deb Primo, is here. So if you want to come up, I'll make you the presenter and we can hopefully get that right. Is it this one? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Oh. 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 Here, just click share. Share will be mine. Oh, okay. I had just had that one up. Send it back. Mm. Uh, people following along wouldn't be able to see it. Yeah, I have to make that screen the presenter. There we go, make presenter. Okay. Just to double check, Casey and Ed, can you see that? Okay, perfect. All right, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm getting IT for Yeah, we can see it. Great, thank you. Okay, I'll turn things over to you now. <laughs> okay. So when I was back in July, we had a draft map that we showed that night. The lines, and it was only a draft, so the lines have changed a little. It's actually better than what it looked like in July. Not much has changed, but a few areas did change. So over um, the 2020 U.S. Census numbers, every 10 years, the reprecincting is done. So back in 2010, our population was 16,188, and by the numbers of last year, it went up to 16,889, so it's only a change of 701. But um, it is later than it normally is because of COVID. Normally it is, the final numbers come out in March and then we're able to do it in the summer. So um, we were one of the last towns to get us information in our maps. So we just need a vote on um, the precinct lines. And you do have in your packet, I believe, the boundaries that we had to go over and um, 
make sure that they were all set. So I don't know if we have any questions. Um, this is, I do send this off to the local election districts review committee um, and the Secretary of State's office has helped with the boundary descriptions and we just have to fill in a few, you know, marks that, um, you know, they, they couldn't see. So Adam and Ed helped me with um, Google Maps and Oliver. <laughs> with the uh, boundary descriptions. Uh, do board members have any questions or comments? Uh, I just had one. I was wondering, so uh, if anyone is a registered voter and they're now in a, a new precinct, um, are they notified in any way or will they just sign so out when they go? To this will go into effect as of December 31st, 2021, virtually, you know, the 1st of January. So anyone that is a town meeting member, and I don't think this map affects any of our town meeting members. The one in July, when it was a draft, there were roads that were going to be changing from three to four, but I believe we, we may be all the same. But they will all still have to run. All town meeting members will have to run, and then, it, you know, they'll be staggered out. Eight, the, the top eight will, be for three years, the next date would be two years, and the last date coming in would be one year. So the town meeting members that are town meeting members right now will be town meeting members for May, but the election, there'll be a whole, all 20 will go back on the ballot. Okay. Um, that's all I have. Uh, since there's nothing else from any other board members, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to accept as presented by our town clerk, Deb Grimo, uh, the 2020 re re precinct, re precincting plan for the town of Auburn. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. I'll just pass this down. Can you just print underneath Deb where just, just sign? It's up to you. If you want to, I can always. Moving on to agenda item 5B, we have the October 26, 2021 draft of special town meeting warrant uh, and vote on recommendations for the warrant articles. We have those in our packets. I know we've had questions about them in the past. Uh, I think just for our last meeting that we saw a lot of the articles at our meeting two meetings ago. Um, so with that, Board members, board members want to take all of the items as one, um, separate them. Mr. Carpenter. Uh, I would like to separate out the zoning articles. I do have a question or two, which I didn't have two weeks ago, but looking at it yet again, I then, for better or worse, um, had a question. The article two, I was just curious as to the line item for the insurance and bonds, what the swing in 25 was about. Um, board members, can I just want to make sure you can hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, uh, 
Um, Mr. Carpenter, I'd be, ha I'd be happy to answer that question, but before I get into that, just a few house cleaning items that I'd like to bring to your attention before you take any action on the county warrant. So uh, I see Dr. Hanfield is, is with us as well. Um, he is available to ask any questions that may be of um, concern regarding the school department, but I could tell you that Article 5, after I had some discussions with uh, Dr. Hanfield, uh, Article 5 is going to be postponed indefinitely. Um, so we're not prepared this time to, to bring forward this amendment because it creates some uh, problems as it relates to the upcoming borrowing. We cannot borrow for that purpose, given the fact that the article has not been passed yet. Um, and Article 9, I know when you previously received your warrant, you said a sum of money. That value is currently estimated at 41000 uh, resulting from information that we received from the fire chief within the last week. Um, relative to Article 2, the insurance and bonds, um, certainly we uh, provide an estimate based upon historical data. Uh, our renewal reflects premiums that are in excess of what we estimated. Um, there's some, also some uh, additional coverage uh, for, um, for new vehicles and things of that nature. Um, I can tell you our work is calm and our uh, IOD policies, given the level of activity, um, they go by risk in, in what they call a five-year mod. Our levels were up, and as a result of that, we're paying a higher premium for the same coverage that we received uh, the prior fiscal year. So that's basically the elements of why we are requesting an increase or an amendment to the insurance and bonds line item. Thank you. Um, I did have a question on Article 5 just because I was somewhat confused. And even though it's going to be postponed, I, I just wanted to be clear. The, the proposed parking lot would be on Bryn Mawr property. It wouldn't be on Swanson Intermediate property. People wouldn't be crossing the road, correct? Correct. Um, and first, good evening, everyone. And, and um, Mr. Carpenter, thank you uh, for that question. So just to give a little bit of backstory um, on this, uh, prior to my arrival uh, as superintendent, the, uh, Dr. Brunel and, and the school department had been bringing forward um, uh, requests for parking lot expansion at Bridmont Elementary School. We, um, as part of our ESSER three funds, uh, received $1.4 million, which we were kind of chunking at about 400,000 and some change per year. Part of that money, as we were looking at it and talking about it with, with the, uh, the, the town um, administration, was that there's a very finite window um, of, of, that you can pass that money through um, in the ESSER 3, one of which is HVAC and, um, uh, yeah, HVAC upgrades. And so we, we were looking at the funds uh, currently in the capital plan. Um, and we started talking uh, about the potential for us to cover our HVAC needs out of the ESSER 3 funds, while at the same time uh, potentially uh, looking to um, kind of mitigate some of the traffic concerns um, in the Bryn Mawr, uh, Swanson area. And really what we'd be looking to do is, you know, uh, for those of you, I'm sure you're all familiar with the baseball field that's, that's down um, at the Bryn Mawr, uh, field. We'd be looking to pave that area now that cars use all the time for parking, be it for soccer or baseball or whatever. And we'd be looking to um, kind of take a, a, a path, if you will, so it's not a parking lot per se, but it's a parking lot where the baseball field is now, and then it would be an adjoining strip of asphalt um, that would be a one-way drive that would loop up and connect into the existing driveway at Bryn Mawr Elementary. So we would have cars coming down in queuing, if you will, in kind of a C fashion um, in the Bryn Mawr Elementary lot. Um, and so, correct, it's, it's a parking lot, but 
you know, because there is parking lot expansion that does need to happen on the this, on the other side of the building where the main parking lot is. But we're trying to be creative in terms of how we can stage um, and queue vehicles uh, for Swanson Road and Bryn Mawr. Um, whereas we're, we've seen with COVID. And even before COVID, I know there was some questions raised uh, in, in some other meetings, you know, about, about you know, was this really necessary or just a one-off for COVID? I think we all would agree, um, you know, that area has never been terrific with traffic during pickup and drop-off and, and during other events over there. Um, so we're looking at a creative way to try and solve the problem. Um, as Mr. Kasdan always said, uh, you know, we are not prepared uh, to the extent that we would like to be uh, to bring this forward. Um, there, is some, there are some, some legalities that we have to go through and um, we have to continue to put together, you know, what we feel would be a plan um, and then bring that forward, you know, certainly to all the respective boards in town. So um, I hope that sheds a little bit more light on, on that article, um, Mr. Carpenter. Yes, it does. Yeah, I was watching finance and it sounded like people were crossing and I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me, not the way yeah. that the yeah, business manager I, I, explained I, it when she was here. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I, and I apologize. I, I, I'm not sure um, that evening, you know, I was unavailable and I'm not sure, uh, not sure perhaps it was articulated um, in the fashion that, that it was articulated just now. Um, but, you know, certainly, like I said, we're, we're, we're looking to, to mitigate some traffic and safety concerns that, that are over in that part of the, of the uh, district. And, um, you know, like I said, we're, we're looking to, you know, be creative, you know, with grant funds that we have um, and, and pass the HVAC upgrades through that the ESSER window and then potentially uh, repurpose the funds um, listed here in Article 5 uh, for potential parking lot expansion. Um, but it's not an expansion per se, it's an expansion of an existing lot at Bryn Mawr, and that it's a reconfiguration um, of a traffic pattern over there, um, utilizing the field. Uh, so I, that's probably a better characterization. Thank you. Um, and my, Thank you. my last one is on Article 9. Uh, and it's more just concern for the fact that we've got asbestos removal. Are we anticipating that West Street is going to be closed for a period of time while they deal with remediation of, of some of these items? Sorry, I had time <laughs> unmuting. Um, Mr. Carpenter, I'm not sure how disruptive that is going to be, that these estimates just came in. And I have not had an opportunity to operationally discuss uh, any impacts that may result of, of this work being done. So I know there was already some asbestos that was removed. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, there was no disruption to the day-to-day -day operations as a result of that. So they're just following some additional pipe that, that is encased in some asbestos. But certainly I can get a report from the chief. I thought he was going to be available to answer any questions that may have resulted tonight, um, given your review of the warrant. Uh, but give me an opportunity to talk to him tomorrow and I can get back to you on that. I appreciate it. And do we have any concerns on the school side, which is the larger part of the building that there is asbestos that might need to be removed on that side of the Randall School. For the chair, if I can uh, jump in, I don't believe that there was any, um, the, the location of where this was found was on the fire side. Um, I don't believe, and the superintendent can uh, jump in here, but I don't believe any additional testing was done on, on the school side. The source appeared to be over on the fire side. I think we should find that out because we certainly, I can't imagine it's, it was left on just a couple of part of the building. I'm sure it's, you know, I'm sure there's more areas and we certainly don't want any staff members to have an issue in case something inadvertently happens at the location. So, okay, thank you. Uh, do board members have any other questions or comments regarding the articles? Seeing as well, I'll just explain to, uh, this is roughly, since I think, just remember this is your first time going through Warren articles. Uh, we have 
the option to vote to uh, recommend, uh, not recommend, defer to the petitioner, or take no position at this time for each of the items or take them in groups and send it off to town meeting. So Mr. Carpenter has expressed that he wants to separate Article 20. I believe that's the only zoning bylaw. In here. 20 through 22, I believe. Mm -hmm. 20 through 22. Potentially 19. 20, 21, 22. And 9. And Article 9? Yes. Just ask one question on Article 19. I apologize. Sure. Um, the way that it's written, it's unclear who's signing the document. Is it the manager signing it? Are we asking town meeting to give the manager the authority, um, along with the sewer commissioners? I wasn't clear as to who was going to be signing off on the easement documents. Excuse me, through the chair, I just want to clarify. And this is on Article 9? 19. I'm sorry, 19. Thank you. So um, this would actually authorize, Article 19 is related to an easement. And anytime we have an easement, town meeting authorizes the Board of Selectmen to sign off on it. Um, I, I believe on some of the documents I've seen, there's also a line for uh, town manager to sign, but the actual the authorization is from the Board of Selectmen. And that's under Mass General Law that the Board is the one that's authorized to issue an easement if they're given the authority by town meeting. As and or the town manager, so I'm like I I don't know. Yep, yeah, it could it could be either. Once you have the vote, you can authorize me to sign on your behalf, but it, you are the ones that are invested with the authority. Thank you. Anything else? Given that our board members comfortable taking um, articles one through eight and ten through nineteen together. Separated. And through 18. 19. That would be 1 through 8 and 10 through 18. The articles not included would be 9, 19, 20, 21, and 22. And probably 5 because that's being postponed. So. Fair enough. We still recommend to approve. This one's good. Uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion. Through the chair, to the chair, just for clarification. Are we just setting aside to discuss those other articles next? Uh, then we'll take separate votes uh, as to whether or not uh, to recommend approval, not recommend. I'll make a recommendation to approve article. Um, Warrant articles one through eight and ten through eighteen. Or two recommends, excuse me. Um, I'll just include uh, with article five being. With article five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, with that, we have articles 9, 19, 20, 21, and 22. Are there any motions? I would just ask that we, uh, I would make a motion that we take note, that we don't take action until town meeting night for Article 9, unless others want to weigh in. Is that a motion to uh, take no action on Article 9? Yes. Yeah. And a motion to make, is there a second? Seeing none, are there any other motions? Uh, through the chair, 
to the town manager, is it possible to have Mr. Carpenter's questions answered in regard to asbestos prior to the meeting? Yeah, through the chair, we can do that and get that information for you. Um, I, I mean, one, one or two suggestions, and I'm sorry, Sharon, was just yeah, we're having trouble, a little trouble hearing okay. what the motion was. So it sounded like the motion was to hold Article 9 to take no position until more information is forthcoming. And then the other part of it was on the night of town meeting. But so to your question, we could get that information to you, or you could, um, I, I, if you wanted, you could take a conditional vote based upon getting the additional information, and we can email it to you or hold off. And then the board would just have to post another meeting on the night of town meeting, right before the meeting, to take a position on it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Julie, if yes, you like, I can, I can reach out to Steve uh, if the board wants to continue. We can take Article 9 up at the end. Yeah, Ed, if you could do that, that would be great. I texted him a few minutes ago and haven't heard back yet. Um, but I was on the phone with him about a half hour ago, so I know he's he's somewhere. <laughs> he, cause he, he I'll call the chief, and if, if I'm unable to get a hold of him, I'll call the deputy, and I'll, I'll ask if... The removal is going to be disruptive in any way, and whether or not they know if the asbestos is going to impact the main part of the school building that is occupied by school administration. And through the chair, Sharon did remind me that. Uh, I'll, um, I'll try it. I'll attempt to call him now. Thanks. Just go on mute, Ed. You do have a, a regularly scheduled board meeting the night before oh. uh, town meeting on the uh, on the uh, 25th okay. so my apologies you don't have to have another one the next night you can cool. anything that you do hold you do have a meeting that night okay. Okay. question to the chair uh, mr. carpenter was it I just want to make sure that it was your intention that you really want to make sure that the entire building correct and and possibly an amendment to to seek to get rid of all the asbestos in one shot absolutely okay we, we certainly don't want it sitting around all right. I, I, I'm with mr. carpenter on that point Uh, there was a motion made, but no second. So we still have articles 9, 19, 20, 21, and 22 uh, in Article 5, actually, with uh, the motions made. So uh, do we have a motion regarding Article 9? Do you want to hold off until? It, yeah. It, it, so we'll, hopefully we'll reach uh, the chief in a few minutes, and you could just come back to that. Okay, so we, so we don't need a uh, to do anything for a few okay. minutes. You can go back to it. I'll okay. withdraw okay. my motion just so that. It's uh, and I think cleaner yeah. that way. So you could go on to the next one, and then we can go back and revisit that motion at that time. Um, okay. Um, we also have the other articles as well. Um, so that was Article 9, we have 19, 20, 21, and 22. Uh, if there are questions or motions regarding those articles in the meantime. I make a motion to vote to recommend Article 19. Motion been made, is there a second? A second. Made and seconded. Uh, to recommend Article 19. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. The chair, can I just ask, is there, um, are there any questions that you have on that, Mr. Carpenter, on that article? No, I, I studied, I studied it, and it's just not something that I think we should be getting involved in. What's that? Uh, so the motion to recommend Article 19 passes three to one uh, for Articles 20, 21, and 22. Uh, is there a motion? I would make a motion that we approve or recommend approval of Article 20. Uh, motion has been made to approve Article 20. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. I would make a motion that we recommend Article 20. Uh, motion has been made to recommend approval of Article 21. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous to approve Article 21. And Article 22. 
I would make a motion that we do not recommend. Motion has been made not to recommend Article 22. Is there a second? I could just have a minute. Sure. <laughs> this is the one related to heights. Um, personally, I think going to move essentially to 120 feet in height, especially in all commercial districts, is not warranted. I certainly would support at increasing the height, but I would not support going to 80 to 120 feet in any of the districts because of their proximity to neighborhoods, which would cast these neighbors into shadow, also create privacy concerns for these residents. And it's, you know, we can certainly look at going up, but I don't see going up to that particular height. I think it's other members have some comments regarding Article 22. They are just found in my packet. <laughs> so there's still a motion. Uh, is there a second? Seeing none, are there any other motions regarding Article 22? Make a motion we defer to the petitioner. Motion been made to defer to the petitioner for Article 22. Second. Motion been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Aye. Aye. And we did two to two. Um, are there any other motions on the table for Article 22? I'll make a motion that the board take no position at this time. Motion been made to take no position at this time. Okay. Uh, 22. Article 22. Okay. So you so you had a no vote because it was two to two. Right, uh, two to two to so now defer. You've got a, another and now motion. this is a motion okay. to. Um, another motion to take, take no, no position. No position. Um, is, so is that uh, sorry? So it, usually it's recommend, not recommend, or defer to the petitioner. So this is just a little different wording. So this is take no position, take no position. not defer. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, yes, um, I, did get a hold, I did get a hold of Chief Coleman. He will be dialing in very shortly to ask any questions that the board may have. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to have Mr. Menard at our next meeting to maybe discuss Article 22 further? Uh, does the board want to? So are you withdrawing your uh, motion to... Uh, take no action at the time. Well, that would still reserve our right to make a recommendation to town meeting under that motion. So. Right, and I'll double check. I believe tonight he's at a uh, planning board meeting. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. He should be hopefully available to at least to come in for that period of it, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so a motion's been made to take no position at this time. Uh, is there a second? Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous, so Article 22 will take no position at this time. And that just leaves Article 9. We'll wait on Chief for that. Don't see him on yet. Lost someone. Uh, that was um, that was the engineer for Article 9 on the easement for the sewer connection that who just left. Oh, okay. so. All right, so if we're waiting on the chief to entertain a motion to move up uh, gift acceptances, those should take long. Uh, agenda items C, 1 and 2. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Uh, under gift acceptances, we have $3,000 to the fire rescue department uh, from Lisa, sorry, is that Link? Sorry, on the name. I think it's F-L-I-N-K. Oh, Flink. Uh, is there a motion? I make a motion that we accept with gratitude and that a letter be prepared uh, for the chair's signature. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. 
and then DPW with a storage shed from United Soccer of Auburn to be placed at the Dr. Arthur and uh, Dr. Martha Pappas Recreational Complex, totaling a value of $5,945. Is there a motion? I just have a question because I, I was a little, I guess, concerned and confused all at the same time because we're, we're accepting a shed that we're nominally, that the town is nominally taking possession of, but a private entity is, it sounds like they're still using it in, in the main. So I wasn't quite clear as to why we would want someone else's shed on town property. Uh, through the chair, and I know uh, DVW Director Joanna Paikin is on the call too, so she most certainly can jump in at any time, but we do have a number of leagues that use our fields regularly, and they keep their equipment there. Um, in some cases, the town owns the, in all cases, the town would own the building, but the sheds are dedicated to the leagues for their equipment for safety purposes. So what has happened is the shed that was being utilized by the soccer league was also being utilized by the town for a number of different uh, recreation culture events. So there was a concern about the equipment that is stored in there for the soccer games that are there. So the town would still own the facility, but it would be dedicated to the soccer league and their equipment. Uh, there is one dedicated for the Little League equipment as well because they're there all the time. Uh, and they do maintain the uh, sheds for us, but they are on town property and they're owned by the town. Joanna, um, do you want to jump in on the shed issue or did I get it? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't, I, I couldn't really hear um, what was said. Um, but the uh, the shed is being donated to town, um, and the I guess the the understanding is that it, it's going to be it, the the town is going to be able to use it as well as um, as the the the, uh, the private entity. Um, so it wouldn't be you know their sole um, for their sole use. Mr. Carpenter, do you have any further questions? No, I'm not entirely comfortable with the arrangement myself, but it's it's obviously a board decision. So through the through the chair, um, in coaching my daughters over the years, not necessarily sheds, but there'd be those big job boxes that were locked up often on town property, and again, they were league specific. Um, and so I think this is a, a practice that's been rather routine for years, in my estimation. Uh, other board questions or comments? For the chair, if I can add to, it's it's kind of similar to the situation that we have with the Snack Shack. Uh, the Snack Shack is operated by one of the leagues, but we give them a license to operate it because technically they're the only ones operating it and they have to use the equipment. Whereas, as Joanna said, this shed is owned by the town like the, uh, like the shack is. However, the town would have the option to utilize it. The concern was they didn't want to have other leagues utilizing it and potentially damaging any equipment that belonged to the soccer league or having any equipment be missing that the town might be uh, liable for as well. Um, I just have one question to uh, Joanna. Do we have anything that we think we'll put in the shed? Uh, the DPW department might store in there now. Uh, is there any? Are there any plans to use the shed? Sorry, I wasn't sure. But is the question whether or not um, the DPW is, is planning on using the shed um, for our own equipment? Right, for any um, town-owned property. Uh, so at, at this time, we don't. We're not planning on, on storing any of our equipment um, in that shed. It would be the you know for the purpose of, of storing you know the um, equipment for for games. So um, we we do have some. Some other uh, property that some other sheds that is shared with uh, the rec department. Okay, thank you. But the possibility is there. Uh, board members have any other questions or comments before we I'll entertain a motion? I'll make a motion that we accept the storage shed from United Soccer of Auburn, USA, be placed at Dr. Arthur and Dr. Martha Pappas Recreation Complex with gratitude. 
second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Okay. Motion passes three with one abstention. I see that Chief Coleman is logged on. So we'll return to Article 9 of the warrant, and I'll hand it over to Mr. Carpenter to re ask your question. I think it's probably best that I unmask, seems that nobody can seem to understand it. Yeah. So it's probably. That's fine. In most instances, not being able to understand me is probably a benefit. <laughs> but, uh, for our purposes tonight, probably not, I guess. Uh, so, Chief, the only question I had was, is there any anticipation that West Street would need to be shut down for a period of time just for the, you know, safety as they're doing removal of asbestos or for any other reason? Uh, good evening, thank you. Uh, so the remediation, uh, the two separate remediations that we've had at the asbestos have already been completed. Um, it was uh, at a level where we, we couldn't uh, allow it to wait, so that expenditure was made out of the building maintenance line item uh, to have that work done. Uh, the station was closed for an eight hour period during the day, uh, so the West Street companies were just moved to headquarters uh, for the daytime and then they were moved back in there uh, by four o'clock in the afternoon on the same day. So all of the asbestos has been uh, remediated. Um, just to, uh, I'm, I apologize, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, Mr. Kazanovich gave you uh, sort of what the breakdown was of what the request is. So we have two separate issues. Um, these articles look to address two separate issues out at West Street. One was a mold issue and one was two separate asbestos issues. Um, but they were they were located at the same time. We actually found the asbestos problem when we were remediating the mold. Um, so the money that I'm looking for out of this article is really to put the $10,000 back into the building maintenance account that was expended to remediate both the mold and to address uh, the HVAC issue uh, or at least some of the HVAC issue, and then to remediate the two asbestos. The building maintenance line item within the fire department is only $20,000, so to spend 10000 before the first of the year on two unanticipated items, that's really what I'm looking for. Uh, the money for is to reimburse the building maintenance account so I don't run into an issue uh, come springtime, which I know we will. And then uh, separate from that, while we were remediating the mold, um, part of the issue of how the mold was created was because the HVAC unit within Station 2, it is undersized, it's a residential unit. Um, not that that's an issue because we could buy a, a little larger of a residential uh, unit. So the fact that it's residential isn't the issue. The real issue is that it's undersized. So it, it works hard, it never shuts off because it's trying to create either a cool space or, a, or a, a warm space depending on the season. So it doesn't shut off, which doesn't really give it a lot of time to rest, which is what creates the additional condensation and that's how the mold came. But if you go into station two and you listen to the unit, it sort of has this death rattle when it starts and when it shuts off. And that's an indication that uh, the unit is about to fail. The unit is 25 plus years old. Uh, so we've certainly got our uh, usable life out of it. Um, but you know, we are, when you open that closet at any given time, the condensation in that closet is, is so bad that sometimes we have to shut the unit off, especially in the summertime. It's frozen solid. We have to let it thaw. And then when the water hits the floor, we have to go in, sweep it up, mop it up with towels. Um, so the, the HVAC closet itself is, is a very damp space, um, which is what contributed to the mold problem. Um, I'm sure the question has come up in terms of if we are pursuing a new fire station, um, why are we looking to spend $21,000 to replace the HVAC system? It is a great question, it's a logical question. Um, the reality is, is that if I didn't feel we needed to spend the $21,000, um, 
I wouldn't be asking for it. But the reality is, is that although everybody, including the Board of Selectmen, is working really hard to see a fire station or a public safety building constructed, we don't know yet if that's going to happen. Um, and you know, so we could do one of two things, and um, you know, we could either go forward looking for the twenty-one thousand dollars at at the town meeting uh, to replace the unit, or you know, option B is we just run the unit until it dies, and then we do an emergency repair of it and deal with it down the road. Um, that wouldn't be my expectation. That wouldn't be my hope. Um, we know that it's going to. We know that it's going to die at some point, um, and I would. I would rather be uh, proactive on that. Um, but again, unfortunately, all of this sort of snowballed at the same time. We discovered the mold. We discovered sort of the more global HVAC issue, and then while we were remediating the mold, um, we found two areas of asbestos that. We knew it was there. It's not that we were blind to the asbestos. Um, we knew that it was in the building, um, but what we didn't know is, due to the age of the building, obviously, in the two areas that needed to be remediated, the asbestos itself was starting to break down, so it was actually starting to flake off the pipe. Asbestos is not a dangerous thing, providing it's intact, providing it's not in the air, it's safe. But when it starts to break down and it starts to flake, and pieces are hitting the floor and the material itself is degrading, that's where it becomes an issue when it becomes airborne particles. And that's the situation we were dealing with in the two areas that we had to have remediated, one in the kitchen area and one on the apparatus floor. Um, so that's sort of a long answer to the question that it's already been remediated, um, so there was little impact as far as station closers. It was just closed for eight hours on two days. Um, so that work has been completed. Like I said, the money that I'm seeking right now is really just to replenish the operational budget because those were un unanticipated expenses that I'm not going to be able to absorb this fiscal year. Thank you. Mr. Governor, do you have anything else? No, that's good. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from board members? Yes, through the chair. Uh, thank you for the explanation, Chief Coleman. Uh, is so? Uh, is it correct to assume that the the asbestos remediation was only done to the fire department side of that building? That is correct, Mr. Ren. Through the chair, I think it's separate budgets, separate separate articles. I mean, but I think that's. I think, Mr. Carpenter raised the point initially. I think there's a concern that the school department should be looking at as well if we have asbestos in that condition, if it's flaking and falling apart. But again, that's not, <laughs> that's just a separate comment. Uh, with that, is there a motion regarding Article 9? Make a motion to recommend. Second. Motion's been made to recommend Article 9 and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you, Chief, for coming on. Not a problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening to the rest of the board. Thank you. Okay, moving on, under proclamations or recognitions, we have none. Tribute hearing hours for this year's Halloween. We have a letter from the Chief enclosed in your packets with the recommendation to set the hours from 5 p.m. through 7 p.m. Uh, I'd make a motion okay. that we set the hours as outlined by the chief on October 31st from 5 to 7 p.m. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Tenenos. And under town manager items. We have a vote to accept and expend funds uh, from the American Rescue Plan Act. So I'll hand that over to the town manager. Through the chair. So exciting. We have a lot of items on here for grants, which is good. Uh, the town administration's been very aggressive going after grants. And uh, I guess I'll go through one at a time. So the first one on here is the, uh, I believe it's the ARPA. Let me just pull it up. Mm -hmm. 
Give me one second, I'm sorry. All right, got it. Thank you. So uh, there, and Ed uh, Kazanovich can jump in, but we actually received what they call two tranches of grant funds uh, through the ARPA, which is the American Rescue Plan Act, the federal funding. So it is, uh, it is allocated to the states, which then are giving municipal allocations based on population. Uh, so the town's share for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts of the municipal allocation is $1,754,873. Uh, if I can just go to part B for a minute, item B, because uh, it is related. Uh, the, there is also a county allocation. So when ARPA was distributed across the country, there were shares that were to be given to counties. We, our region, Worcester region, doesn't have county government. Yes, we are we are in Worcester County, but we don't have a county government. There are only a couple of county governments in Massachusetts. So the county governments, such as Plymouth County, will receive the county allocation. To be fair, the Commonwealth is distributing the what would have been a county allocation that we don't have a county to the individual communities within the counties. So we still will be getting the money and it's going directly to the towns as opposed to going to a county government which would then make a determination on which towns get it and for what. So this is a good thing for Auburn. So our share of the county ARPA funds is even higher than the municipal funds. And that's $3,256,599. And uh, Ed, do you want to add anything to that and explain that we got the 50% of each? <laughs> I apologize. I think I heard my name. The audio was not <laughs> that good coming out of the, the board meeting okay. tonight. Let, let me, uh, if, if you don't mind, I'll do this. Does that help, Ed? Can you hear me? So I seem to hear better out of Dan's mic. It's, it's tough to decipher what's okay. coming out of yours, Julie. Okay. Let me try this. Can you hear me now on this? That's a little better, yeah. Okay, I'll try this. So, Ed, I just explained the two, number A and number B, which is the municipal allocation and the county allocation of the ARPA funds and how the federal government distributes it and why we're getting a county share because we don't have a county government. So I, I just turn to you. Do you want to briefly explain that we did receive the first tranche of each of these uh, in a payment at, valued at 50%? I think I heard, I heard what you said. I'm going to take a stab at it. So we did receive 50% of the allocation that's been earmarked for Auburn. Um, so we received roughly half of the 5011000 It's broken out at the county level and the direct, uh, direct reimbursement or allocation from the state. Um, there are... Um, there are dates that are associated with the expense of those funds. I think the projects have to be in place by no later than December of 2024 with an expo potential expiration date of 2026. Now those dates seem to be floating as time goes on, so certainly we may expect some changes to that. Uh, we had a couple of meetings with the department heads to discuss the potential uses of, of these earmarks. I think Julie has, has provided some of that to you in advance of, of tonight's meeting. Uh, but certainly, um, like the CARES money, there seems to be some modifications and changes to its potential use that we're monitoring on a day-to-day -day basis. So we do have some HVAC uh, projects, some, um, some sewer and water infrastructure projects that we're considering, uh, but, but certainly nothing has been nailed down yet. So Julie, is that the type of recap you were looking for? Are you looking My to time, yes. put something <laughs> in addition to what I, I just offered? Thank you, Ed, that's great. I, I think right now I can just go through the memo uh, that we put in their packets uh, because I think we're only gonna be seeking one vote tonight for an allocation uh, and the rest are all just for discussion and future future conversations. So... Um, yeah, in addition to that, if I may, uh, we did... Um, 
We did look into the eligibility of some money to be used for AYFS. Uh, they had some um, additional uh, need as a result of COVID-19 uh, for the youth of, youth of our community. Um, I believe that the um, the youth commission is met and took a position on that. Uh, so certainly, I think initially we're asking for a portion of those funds to be used exclusively for uh, youth and counseling services that would fall under Auburn Youth and Family Services. Correct. So thank you, Ed. So in your packet tonight, uh, there is a, a memo detailing some of what Ed just said, that the total amount that the town will receive in ARPA funds is $5,011,472 uh, in two tranches, 50% now, 50% at a later date. Uh, I've been on in several meetings over the last two weeks, um, both at a conference and today at a at a board meeting uh, where ARPA funds are being discussed. And almost across the entire state, there are very few communities that have made any final determinations on the ARPA funds. And there are several reasons for this. Uh, and just to summarize, the first one is that the state will also be receiving ARPA funds. In addition to the dollars that we are all getting, the state will get a very large amount of ARPA funds. It's my understanding they're getting $5.3 billion. And of that, $1.3 billion will be allocated somehow to cities and towns. That has not been determined yet. Is it a formula? Will there be programs? The legislature is discussing it now, asking what priorities are. Will it go to infrastructure? Will it go to water, sewer, business assistance? There are so many eligible categories under the ARPA funds, but the state has not yet released their recommendations for how they're going to use the state share to help communities. So while we've put together a list of our priorities, there's a good chance that the state may be able to fund some of our priorities, thus freeing up our allocation for another priority. So we don't want to get ahead of that and finalize a recommendation on something where we could potentially get additional funding for it and free up money for other needs in the town. So that's the first reason. The second one is, as Ed mentioned, we have preliminary guidelines from the US Treasury Department. They change often and they're not final. So our major concern, and I say our, I say collectively our as municipalities across the state, our concerns are that if the US Treasury makes any changes to the guidelines and we've already committed funding, there could be a clawback, so to speak, of the funds that we committed, and then we have to repay them if it's determined later that they're not eligible. So we don't want to, we, we want to make decisions and make thoughtful decisions, but we want to make sure when we make the decisions, nothing will change that puts any kind of financial exposure on the town. And the third reason, similar to the one I mentioned on the federal side, there, there are elections coming up. And in uh, 2022, those, and, and the following year as well, anytime there are elections for any open seats, there could be a shift in philosophy on ARPA funds at the federal level, in Congress and uh, in the Senate. And if that happens, there's a potential that the upper funds could be reduced. Uh, the use of them could change. So given that we have until, as Ed said, December 31st, 2024 to obligate the funds and then December 31st, 2026 to spend them, we don't want to recommend that we rush into it and do it now until we are really sure that what we're recommending will be eligible. So what we've given to you, as Ed mentioned, we've had several meetings over the last few months internally with all the department heads and tried to narrow down our priorities to give all of you uh, some food for thought of what we believe are the priorities. And as Ed said, the one priority that we believe that we are confident making a commitment to now uh, would be AYFS. Uh, that is clearly eligible. They service a population that is dis, uh, disproportionately impacted by COVID and the economic impacts of COVID, and in many cases, the health impacts. Uh, AYFS provides community programming uh, for youth, for families. They, they, they have a lot of support services. They had indicated to us that they needed $60,000, and that is the amount that we uh, determined would be a one-time use. It is my understanding that once they get uh, the $60,000 
$100,000 that they potentially will be back on track for next fiscal year. The thing that happened to them this fiscal year, my understanding is that they were not able to have some of the summer session programs that they normally run that generates a revenue for them. Uh, they're, they're wonderful programs, but they also generate some of their operating revenue, and they weren't able to hold that. They also weren't able to hold some of their fundraisers due to COVID uh, because of the community aspect of it. So they are they do have that shortage right now. So we were comfortable as an administration recommending $60,000 so they could continue the services to the population that really has been hit hard by COVID. We feel that that would be the one thing now we're confident if for any reason that ever changed and it was not eligible, $60,000, we will find another way to absorb it somewhere uh, versus looking at a $3 million sewer project that would be pretty difficult to find to find funding to, to cover. Thank you. Uh, do board members have any questions or comments? Mr. Carpenter. So I'm certainly happy to uh, approve 60 tonight, um, but I would like to see us as a community hold public meetings and have the residents speak on what their priorities are, because ultimately that's all of our purposes is to serve what, what the public needs or what they perceive as their needs. So I would certainly 100% support AYFS because of what's been going on, um, but I, I would want to limit any motion to just that, just expending that amount and requesting that town administration hold a series of meetings and hopefully the school department will do the same, but that's... And through the chair, we're not asking for any other vote this evening. Uh, we're just asking for a vote for AYFS. But uh, um, and, uh, you know, I'll wait and see if the, if um, Mr. Carpenter makes a motion and second, and if that's what the board wants us to do. But before we get to that, if I could just point out some of the priorities that uh, we've identified, and we're happy to, if the board would like, you know, we can hold public meetings and talk about what some of the other needs are. There are specific categories. Again, it, it may change. Uh, some of the categories would be difficult for us to pursue on our own. And I mentioned it in the memo, something like business assistance. We don't have the organizational capacity to manage uh, a financial loan or grant program for businesses. There's a lot to be determined, whether they got money through CARES, whether they got uh, other other monies, uh, how was it spent? Is it prudent use of our dollars to help a, a private business? So we were not recommending that. However, we are pursuing the potential for some regional business assistance assistance programs, hopefully through the state, uh, where the state would actually be helping to possibly set up uh, maybe some business resource centers or business assistance centers funded through ARPA for the next four years, where actually they would be able to hire staff and, and manage it. So that's been one of the recommendations that we've made uh, to our legislators as far as moving forward. So it wasn't one of our recommendations, again, because I, we don't feel confident or comfortable managing that type of outlay uh, into, the, into the business community. So we are looking at sewer upgrades, and again, these could change over the next couple of years, but right now, these are our priorities. You know, the Warren Road pump station, the Pin Rock bypass hookup, uh, the Sword Street culvert, and the and, uh, sewer force mains. Uh, our sewer system is aging. We, we have aging infrastructure, and we're trying to look at areas that may uh, cause problems in the future, immediate future, and would be very expensive to the town. We, I assure you, we look for grants all the time. So we're looking at things that we have not been able to identify grant funding for. That may change also. The state may come out with a pot of money using their ARPA funds for sewer in improvements, in which case we wouldn't recommend it. But right now, we think sewer impacts everybody in town, pretty much, so almost everybody. So we thought that that would be something that we should definitely consider. Whether it's one, two, or three of these, it will all depend on the cost. Um, but these are, these are some of the severe sewer needs that we have. Also, we went through the one-year planning process to come up with an ADA transition plan and to identify all of our municipal and school facilities, buildings, fields, parks, playgrounds that are in need of ADA upgrades. So we feel that we should put a, a portion, again, these numbers can move around, but we were just suggesting a portion of that. If I recall, the total amount of ADA upgrades, if we were to do it all together, was somewhere between two and three million dollars, and clearly we're not required to do 
do that right away. But if we could start picking away at it. And um, we do have a grant you'll see later putting in for small portions because the grant is small. But to have a larger portion of money to identify some of the ADA upgrades that we need, you know, ARPA may be a good use of it. It appears to be eligible. Again, we before we made any expenditures, obviously we want the approval of the board, but we wouldn't recommend it if it turns out it was not eligible. Uh, also, as you just heard from fire chief, HVAC replacements and upgrades to municipal buildings may be eligible. Uh, we did not think of it for the fire, we thought of it for the fire station, we are not recommending it for the fire station because if indeed that station closes in three or four years, we will likely have to pay that back. And we're, the needs at the fire station are, are more immediate now, but we also, we have serious HVAC issues at the police department. Uh, we're in the process of trying to get a cost for that. That could be well over a million dollars. It could be a million and a half dollars just for the police station. And we have some HVAC issues here in Town Hall. You know, this is an old building and it just wasn't designed for the use that it currently has. So we were going to recommend looking at HVAC uh, replacements. Again, fluid number, uh, if this was something that the board was interested in doing, we know how much money we spend every year to uh, repair and maintain the HVAC system at the police station, and we just haven't had the revenues. And whether a public safety facility remains in place or not, uh, the plan would be under a new joint facility to relocate the school department to the police station. So most of the building would be fine for the school department. They don't need some of the things that the police need for their operations, but an HVAC system is still something that is needed to be looked at. Uh, the other we just put in there, uh, water infrastructure and water quality. We have not been approached yet by the water department, but uh, and it's technically it's not a town operation, but yet it's town water. It is water that services our town. So we thought we should at least put some type of mark in there to keep the conversation going to see if there are any needs from the water districts. Uh, we also have a need at the library. When we put the addition onto the library that we are planning to do, it will trigger uh, the need to put in a brand new sprinkler system for $230,000. And we have been cobbling together the funds. Uh, this, this we, we're getting there. Uh, that 160 would get us to the end. We may have a possibility of a grant in the meantime, so that could come off, but it is a, it is a priority need. Uh, so I wanted to put that on there. And then other needs and family services I did include. So those are just the general categories that the board had asked us to come back with our recommendations and our thoughts on it. Uh, so certainly those are our most pressing needs within the categories of ARPA. There are other needs, but uh, not within the categories that we're currently allowed to, to use. So that is uh, basically a report. We're just looking tonight to start the conversation. Uh, again, the only one that we would seek a vote on because there does seem to be a, a time sensitive issue is, is AYFS and everything else open for a discussion. You know, one of the recommendations we were going to make too was maybe the board would want to have a hearing, the board have a hearing and solicit the input from the public as well. Um, if you wanted it for town administration, that's fine. You know, it, it could work, EOA could work jointly, but I know oftentimes the board has had public hearings to solicit uh, input from the residents on, on certain things. So we, you could certainly do that. If we did do that, we have to make very clear what the parameters are of the current uses because you, you kind of have to make sure that people are thinking within the parameters of the eligibility uh, as opposed to what the needs are because the needs are always so great. And we could use the entire amount for our sewer system and, and still not upgrade the whole thing. So, and I'm sure we find that in other priority areas as well. So I, I believe I covered all of it in there. Again, we want to just continue the conversation. We're not recommending that we make any final decisions quite yet. We're keeping our eye on ARPA. We're keeping our eye on the state and U.S. Treasury. Thank you. And any one of these things is a wonderful thing. I just believe that we should seek public comments and see what, and again, I think this is a wonderful exercise so that the citizens 
understand what this money is being used for as well. So it's both a it's both an outreach as well as mm -hmm. they might all sit there and, and say every single one of these ones I want to see done, and that's fine. I just feel as a member of this board that we shouldn't be the ones making the decisions without some public input mm -hmm. from the residents. So that's why I'm more cautious. Not that any of these things I wouldn't jump up and say, great, they're wonderful, and no, fully understand. Let's 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 do it. But in that, this is a one-time opportunity. I also want to make sure that we're giving the public an opportunity to speak on it. But again, we're a five-member board, so uh, it's, it's going to be up to, to them. But I would make a motion that we uh, vote to accept. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> if you have a question. Uh, through the chair, um, I agree with Mr. Carpenter that uh, public input is always good, but uh, Ms. Jacobson, I think this is a great start. You understand the, the time frames to work. You're not jumping at anything. Um, I think the, I think this is well thought out. So thank you for that. Um, and then also, just wanted to let the other board members know. Well, you guys already know, but I wanted to make it known that uh, I am president of Auburn Youth for another 14 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I did fill out the appropriate paperwork with our town clerk today. I don't have any financial interests in being president of Auburn Youth, and I don't think that um, my position as president would infringe on my ability to make a, an impartial vote here tonight, so I do intend to take part in that vote. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Carpenter, you were making a motion? I was. Uh, I would make a motion that we vote to accept the funds and authorize the expense or the expenditure of $60,000 for AYFS immediately. Second. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, now that should be for um, A and B, correct? Correct. On to 6C, vote to accept and expend 20,000 the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Community Compact Grant Funds. Uh, through the chair, if you recall, the state had come out with a community compact grant program. It's called the Best Practices Program, and it was several years ago, and we received three community compact grants from that program. Uh, we got the economic development plan done, the housing plan done, and a uh, pre-K program at the schools. So we had to wait a couple of years until those were completed before we were eligible to apply again. So uh, we reached out to the Commonwealth and put in an application just to see if it would be something that the state would consider. And literally within 48 hours, not only did we get feedback, but we got approval uh, for the use of, of funds. So there were a couple of he couple here. Uh, I still have to work on the paperwork with the state, so the, the funds aren't in place yet. But the first one under C would be $20,000 to fund an analysis of a potential joint human resource function with the town and school department. And I'm not sure, I think Dr. Hanfield was on, but I will tell you that uh, Dr. Hanfield, myself, uh, Ed Kaznovich, and uh, Dr. Hanfield's team, we've had a couple of meetings over the last couple of years, but especially over the last couple of months discussing could we possibly look to coordinate and collaborate on some of our HR issues. I know I brought it up years ago when we first did the reorganization plan in 2011, and Dr. Hanfield was extremely supportive of the idea. It would be beneficial to both of us if we could share our resources, share our staffing, share our uh, programming and the systems that we use for HR benefits coordination, uh, payroll, uh, all of that. I know Ed has had several meetings with uh, Dr. Hanfield, his team, and Ed's financial team to try to make it a little more simple to handle payroll for, for both uh, the school and the town side. So basically, this grant would be to do an analysis of how do our functions work now on the town side, on the school side. What do we do together? What could we do together? And what maybe should we not do together and separate? So it would be uh, bringing in a consultant. There were, we reached out to about 10 communities across the Commonwealth who had a best practice grant to do this. And uh, it appears that there are a couple of excellent consultants who have done this for other towns. And this was the price that we were given to 
to do this and the state was very supportive. So it would be our intent if the board is willing to accept and expend the grant funds to reach out and go into a contract uh, with a consultant to start this study. Our hope would be if we can get the consultant on board, we could actually have some recommendations possibly for next fiscal year. I know the budget's coming up now, uh, but even if it wasn't budgetary recommendations, just looking at administrative and organizational structure. You know, how can we do this better for, for everybody who's involved in the process? And how can we build in some redundancy? So if someone is on vacation, uh, we can still get payroll done. If somebody is out sick and they weren't planning to be away, we're not gonna have issues with payroll. So this happens on both the school and the town side when you're in a smaller organization. So it's these are issues we have to look at. So we're excited. So that is what that grant is about. So if the board is supportive of it, um, we would go forward and enter into a contract. Uh, do board members have any questions or comments? Through the chair, this a lot of HR functions are, they're not industry specific whatsoever. So this seems like this could cure a lot of duplicative efforts. Um, it seems like a no-brainer. It's good. Pretty else? I have a question that just applies to actually C through K. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any matching funds for any of the grants? Let me take a quick look. I will go through all of them, but I do. I know for sure there is not on C. Uh, I don't think there are in any of them actually, because we would have put it in here. So no, there are not. Great. Thank you. Um, seeing that there are no other questions, um, is there a motion regarding 60? and make a motion to accept and expend $20,000 in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Community Compact grant funds to fund analysis of the potential joint human resource function with town and school departments. Motion has been made, is there a second? Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. We'll uh, keep you apprised of that. The next one is, uh, sorry, the uh, another Commonwealth Community Compact Grant. So one of the best practices that was available to communities to participate in is a cybersecurity assessment. And as you know, cybersecurity is critical. We prioritized it a couple of years ago. We've been very fortunate to have Mike Barino as our IT director and John working with Mike, who's really taken a proactive approach to cybersecurity. As all of you know, because you've been part of it, we have regular testing, we've had some equipment upgrades, uh, we've, we've received several grants to help us prepare our employees and our users of our systems for a potential attack and what to avoid. But we really would like to have an assessment of each department because we're not all necessarily on the same uh, IT system. So the library has certain functions that they use through the state. The police department has certain functions that they use. So one of the best practices that we applied for and did receive approval for was to expend $20,000 to get a consultant to come in and analyze where we may have risk factors for cybersecurity. Um, I, I would tell you, Ed and I and Tom have been meeting this, probably this entire last month, almost on a daily basis to go over our bond rating. We actually have our bond rating tomorrow. Uh, because we are getting to what we need to borrow. And we have our ratings call with Standard & Poor's. And one of the questions that was sent to us in advance was what strategies have you taken to address potential cybersecurity threats? So not only is it an operational threat to a community, it's a major financial major financial threat if something happens. So it has risen to the level of even being something that the bond rating agencies are talking about. So we, we just feel this is really important. And I think the best strategy that we can develop is to do an assessment of all of our systems and see where the weaknesses may be and what the recommendations of the consultant are to address them. And then be able to build that into our CIP and future uh, requests for funding, whether it be in the operational budget or the CIP, and make sure we're doing everything we can. You know, I'll quote Mike Marino, because he says this often, it's not a matter of if something will happen, it's a matter of when and how bad it's gonna be. It, it, everybody is vulnerable to it. I was on a call today with a community that the treasurer's office received two separate requests for $48,000 for transfers and both were bogus requests. Um, it, it's happening every day. So whatever we can do to prevent it, that, that's, that's our goal. So that is what that particular grant is. And again, no match, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any board members have any questions or comments? 
glad that I graduated with someone who's working in cybersecurity right now and actually has helped some municipalities and the things he's told me about are pretty awful, so I'm glad <laughs> we're doing this. <laughs> it is frightening. Um, so with that, is there a motion? I actually just have one question. So the assessment, um, what do we have in CIP going forward, or is this going to help to inform CIP going forward as well? Both. Both. So um, we have, in the CIP, we do have a, an Ed jump in. I don't know if Ed can hear. Ed jump in if, I, if you can. Uh, the CIP for IT security. Um, I can tell you right now, Mike Marino is submitting a grant that's due this Friday. It's another IT grant that's specific for just IT equipment. And we are putting in for two backup servers, uh, which will be uh, equipment that we could then take off of our CIP if we get the grant. Uh, if not, those will have to go on to the uh, CIP list. And then any, f we've received some equipment already. Uh, we've put some different systems into place already. And I believe before we put anything else in the CIP, unless something came in as emergency, we want to get the assessment done to see what the best recommendations are. But the, the backup servers are absolutely something that we needed, as well as the security cameras, which are uh, on one of the warrant articles that you see. And there is also an assessment, a cybersecurity assessment map for $3,000 on the warrant article for October as well. It's a little different than an assessment. I'm not as technical as Mike is, but it is a different procedure. One is looking at a mapping of what you do in an emergency. Uh, should you have a cyber attack? What, is, what are we all going to do? How is it handled? What do you do? The, the assessment is where are the weaknesses within our systems? So we do have two items on this this fall's um, warrant for it, and hopefully we, we, we remove some. Is that it, Eddie? Did I get it? Yeah, so if I, if I may add to that, we're, we're fighting this battle on two fronts. Number one, I think as Julia alluded to, uh, we currently have a grant. We're educating our employees on certain aspects of, of, of traps that they shouldn't fall into. Uh, each employee is, is trained through uh, the state uh, with a series of, of modules that's been very beneficial and helpful uh, in, in trying to avoid uh, certain traps and situations that, that could really cripple our systems. Number two, from the CIP perspective, we are uh, earmarking money in half, uh, but, but more importantly, moving forward for firewall safety and, and, and software um, enhancements that will detect and block certain things that or certain intrusions that may compromise our system. So I know Mike is on top of that. He evaluates that on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're going into discussions on his CIP for the um, for FY26. Certainly, those priorities change based upon you know current activity and current market conditions. So that's a discussion we have all the time, and it's and it's changing. Uh, the, the the recommendations are changing over that five year period, uh, based upon um, you know different different situations and different revisions that we need to to at least consider to safeguard our our, our data system. So, um, so Mr. Copter, I hope that that answers your question. It does. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? With that, is there a motion? Can I make a motion that we vote to accept and expand? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. So the next five grants are actually state earmarks in the FY22 budget that we were very fortunate to receive through our legislative delegation. So first of all, I want to thank Senator Moore and Representative Frost for their work on behalf of the of the town. Uh, early in the in the budget process at the state level, they uh, on an annual basis reach out to us to see what our priorities may be and what we may be seeking earmarks for. And generally, we choose those earmarks based on priorities that have been identified 
required by the town through master plan, through uh, Drury Square vision plan, through you know town meeting votes such as the library glutted park uh, project. So anything where we're having a hard time finding a source of funding would be a good thing to request an earmark for. Surprisingly, uh, we received five earmarks in this particular budget. The state did uh, extraordinarily well on their revenues this year. Uh, it, they exceeded their expectations by a significant percentage. So a lot of those dollars were fortunately given back to communities through the FY22 budget. So the next five are all state earmarks. They, when the state earmark goes into the budget, the mechanism or the vehicle for getting it to the town is to go through a grant through one of the appropriate state departments that is related to what the earmark is for. So uh, with your permission, I'll just go through each one. So the first one, uh, we had asked for $25,000. Uh, some of these actually, I would say we asked for more and this is the amount that we got. But So what I should say is we received $25,000 for the replacement of the Mary D. Stone playground. So when we sold the building, the Mary D. Stone building to Penrose. Part of that um, development uh, agreement was that Penrose would be giving us $25,000 for the Mary D. Playground upgrades and the Julia Bancroft Playground upgrades. When uh, we went to the work needed to be done on the playgrounds, it needed to be relocated, it was not a safe playground, it was not safe enough to dismantle and put back together. So we have been seeking additional funds to be able to purchase a new playground for Mary D. The 25,000 will be able to help us upgrade the Julia Bancroft, that does not need replacement, but this one needs to be replaced. So uh, with the funding from Penrose and this earmark, we'll be able to replace uh, the Mary D playground. And we would uh, go out on the state bid list this winter and hopefully have it installed in the spring. So that is a grant specific for that playground. Do you want me to take them all and then take a, 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 a is that okay? Uh, the board members want to take a motion to take uh, E through I. To, actually, I guess we'll hold off on that until afterwards. We get to okay, because they're all, the, the next couple are, are fairly related. So the next is uh, $50,000 for playground improvements. This was not specified in the state budget for any specific playground. So we will be looking to see which playgrounds are in need. Again, we may have some ADA uh, upgrades that need to be done to our playground. So this $50,000 could go toward any of those. So we're going to go back to the ADA transition plan and look to see which playgrounds have the most uh, need to make them accessible for all children. So that would be that $50,000. Uh, the the next one is uh, improvements to Glided Park. Again, we uh, when we did the library, pedestrian bridge, Glided Park, proposal to town meeting, we acknowledge that there may be additional costs that go to park that haven't been identified and we would continue to seek grant funding so that we could you know, expand the scope if we had to. In the interim, as I mentioned earlier, when the architect came in to look at the library for the sunroom addition, the size of the sunroom addition, based on the size of the library, and it's not that big of an addition, it triggers the need to put a sprinkler system for the whole library. Uh, one of the schools just went through a similar thing. Anytime you make a, an improvement. It was our hope that we, it wouldn't be considered uh, a trigger for the sprinkler system, but it is. So we would be taking some of the funding from that whole library, pedestrian bridge, Goda Park project, shifting it toward the sprinkler system, but we can backfill it with this $50,000. Uh, so, you know, we would still have the same 200 available for the Goda Park if we take 50 out of the out of the other one. We don't need any votes because it was for an entire project from three parts. So this 50 actually is allowing us to offset the town meeting approved dollars to be able to take 50 from that and put it toward the sprinkler system. And then I bring your attention to the next one which also would go toward the sprinkler system. This was $25,000. I'm sorry, the, the last one is 20, number I, 20, uh, 
$50,000 for a state earmark for public health and safety improvements in the town of Auburn. So that is a public safety. It's coming out of EOPS, which is uh, Executive Office of Public Safety. And it would be, you know, a fire code issue. So we would, so we've just identified just with these earmarks alone, $75,000 that we can put toward the sprinkler system, uh, which is why we are hopefully looking at ARPA for the remaining, although we do have a couple of grant applications that we're working on right now for the sprinkler system. So we're looking to find different sources to do that. And then the last one would be, uh, this was interesting, we had put in for $25,000 each for two vehicles for a total of 50,000. And when the legislature approved this, which we are grateful they did, it was approved for $25,000 for two, not 50,000 for two. So that created uh, a budget gap on our end because the vehicles are approximately $32,000. They've gone up since we first put the request in, especially with COVID uh, and all the backup with the car manufacturers, the electric vehicles have gone up. That being said, as a green community, we support electric vehicles. We are working right now on a grant to get uh, two electric vehicle charging stations at Town Hall, both for our own vehicles for the future, as well as for residents. So we now have $25,000 that we are required to buy the two electric vehicles, but I'm happy to say we also have money in our municipal aggregation account for energy efficiency projects. So we can make up the deficit, uh, I shouldn't say the deficit, we'll make up the balance between this and the remaining money to purchase the two vehicles, the two inspectional vehicles, uh, with the municipal aggregation funds, which is a, you know, a perfect use for that. So with this 25,000, we will be able to get the two electric vehicles, which will actually down the road remove a vehicle from the CIP list that was on there for DVIS. They did just get another vehicle, but we anticipate extensive um, needs in the community with a lot of the projects that are coming online uh, for inspections. Right now, there is a, uh, an arm wrestle to get vehicles because there's so many projects going on. The vehicles are also shared with the assessor's office. So we uh, absolutely, these would be specific to uh, public health, excuse me, to DDIS um, for building inspections and public health inspections, which would free up some of those vehicles for some of the other inspections that have to be done as well. So I think that just covered all of them. So th those are the earmarks. And again, that uh, through the hard work of Senator Moore and Representative Frost. Do board members have questions on any of the uh, articles E through I? Mr. Um, so from the, for the playgrounds, in that Penrose has basically used it as a staging area. Are they at least putting back a grass surface for us at their expense? That's not yes. Out Pen, of yes, they they have a license to utilize the property temporarily for the construction. When they are done utilizing it, they will restore the field. Uh, the they had also indicated if the playground cost exceeded the money that we had to put into it that they're willing to uh, talk to us about that and hopefully help us out. So uh, yes, they will be repairing the field to the condition that it was in previously and it wasn't in very good condition. So I'm sure when it's put back, it will be better because we'll have all fresh grass there. Um, but the playground itself, again, that does have to be new. So we, can, we won't be putting back any of the old playground that we took out. That's understood. I don't know that I would be worried. I was more worried about the fact that the grass disappeared. And for the residents in this area, it may not have been much of a park for some people's opinion, but it was used. So, you know. That was the intent. It's like was us to, to go it. to, you know, some state of, you know, you got to use it, you needed it, that's fine, but at the back end, we need to have it so that it's in some sort of usable format. Um, and on the electric vehicles, mm -hmm. I, I guess I have two questions. So you answered one, which is we're not taking any other vehicles out of circulation. So this is augmenting the vehicles that we already have in our fleet. Mm -hmm. um, in that we send most of these to fleet repair, how is the electric vehicles going to be serviced and what kind of other expenses will we be facing for these two vehicles outside of what we're already looking at? So it is my understanding that the uh, maintenance and repair on the electric vehicles is far less than maintenance and repair on 
non-electric vehicles. Um, the main expense would be the electric charging stations, which we are getting a grant uh, through the, it was a combination of the states and tax credits and national grid to install two in at city uh, at town hall. Some communities have put them in other locations. We've looked at other locations, but before we did that, we thought we'd just get the two in there first. Um, ultimately, we want to see where the public safety facility is going, so we'll probably apply for another grant. So but there are multiple grants out there, and with the current uh, federal administration, there are uh, there's a lot of talk of increasing the tax credits and availability of other uh, vehicles and support systems for electric, for electric vehicles. Um, so right now, it would be our intent that our, whatever maintenance was needed, uh, would be able to be handled through DPW. Uh, but it, it is anticipated it would be far less than purchasing new vehicles. Uh, over time, Mr. Carpenter, if we find as our vehicles start aging and they're no longer able to be used or repurposed, as some of these other projects come to completion, we may not need to replace some of those other vehicles either. Um, because you know, five years down the road, we may not have as many inspections going on as we have right now. It's, the fleet is becoming an issue, I think. And it's whether anybody an issue with? Or with the voters, with the residents seeing a lot of expensive vehicles. And I'm just bringing it up as something that I'm constantly hearing is concern for the expense as well as the taxes and everything else, which I know nobody wants to necessarily discuss up here, but that's what we need to, we do need to give them the opportunity to share their thoughts with us, even if it's at a meeting, which would be nice if they would come and share what their concerns are rather than indirectly through, through members, not that there's anything wrong with them talking to us individually. Um, I'm not opposed to the electric vehicles, I'm just concerned about cost. What is the differential between the cost of fueling an electric vehicle and a gas-powered vehicle? It will actually be less expensive. It will be less expensive um, because we will have the charging stations here. So, uh, Ed, do you recall from the meeting what is the total cost for the stations? Was it $100? I don't know if you can hear me. I, I couldn't say with certainty, Julie. I know the cost is substantially less. I mean, your your day-to-day -day cost outside of fuel. I mean, you're still going to have maintenance relative to wear and tear on the, the tires and things of that nature, uh, and some of the other. And the other in part, but the mechanical aspect, the combustion, and all of those parts, there's be a significant savings by not replacing or maintaining some some of those, um, some of that equipment. I don't know what the estimated savings is on a gas or a diesel engine vehicle versus an electric. I'm sure there is some information out there that we can share with the board. I, I don't have that at my, my disposal right now. Thanks, Ed. We do uh, we do have some information from National Grid that we could share with the board. Uh, we're also in the process of doing an evaluation of our fleet, just to determine uh, what where we might be able to make some savings. And I certainly appreciate that. I've had a couple of residents over the years call and ask about the vehicles, and when I've explained the vehicles that we purchased, why we purchased them, and what we saved by purchasing them, they were comfortable with that. So it's clearly, if anyone calls, we're happy to discuss it. I would say on these two electric vehicles, we're getting two electric vehicles for no cost to the town other than the maintenance. Uh, and again, we need to have vehicles anyway, which is why we put in for them. So this is no cost to the taxpayer, uh, 25,000 from the state and the remaining approximately 50,000 from the energy uh, efficiency account. So I think that that's a positive thing to let the residents know that there was no cost to the taxpayer. As far as maintenance, uh, there will be, um, but it, it will be less than if we were to purchase two vehicles. And hopefully down the road, uh, we, we may not need to replace some other vehicles. We could go with these. these last, the electric vehicles have a longer life than um, a regular non-electric vehicle, fuel, fuel powered vehicle. I just want the information out there and I don't think that's a bad thing what we're doing. I'm just 
bringing up things that are of, and they are of concern to me. Our affordability as a community is a serious concern going forward, and I think we need to really look at our expenditures as a community and, and really have a good talk about it. You know, nobody's saying what we have isn't great. It's just we're pricing people out, and that's not okay. Mr. Carpenter, I would argue that these steps would save the taxpayer money. Do the board members have any questions or comments? So regarding the charging stations, mm -hmm. um, so we'll have two at Town Hall. I imagine town vehicles will have priority. Could you say that they would also be open? Yes, it will be both. Um, they're separately metered, so when uh, a non-town vehicle utilizes the station, it's separately metered, and then there's a cost to them to charge their vehicle. Uh, the town would then get its own electric bill uh, to charge the vehicle as well. Uh, would we, so just, uh, we're charging that individual who wasn't a town employee, you're charging an electric vehicle there. Uh, with town profit from that, or would we be paying with the at cost? Of the no, that it goes to the electric company. Okay. Mm -hmm. all right, thank yeah, you. they wouldn't be paying the town at all. Yeah, okay. we, we're providing the equipment, uh, the equipment to be utilized, but mm -hmm. not. Yeah, we, we wouldn't have to do that. Get into that. Just wanted that. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're doing a lot of work on it. I said, uh, and Ed mentioned it. I don't have the cost in front of me either. I know Shannon Regan and Adam Bernard have been very active. Uh, they had another meeting last week. I was away. I was not had it with National Grid uh, to look at all these programs. And it is complicated. The electric vehicle uh, programs are pretty complicated. But again, we're excited because there are opportunities now to get some of these things in our town uh, and to help residents. You know, we are seeing more electric vehicles on the road just in general. Great, thank you. Uh, with that, is there a motion for uh, articles E through I? Make a motion to accept and expend, as stated in the agenda, for items six, E, F, G, H, and I. Second. Aye. Aye. Thank you very much, and thanks for all the questions. And. and this isn't, I, I just want to say, if you have additional questions after this, because we put a lot on here tonight, you know, give me a call, add a call. We can get any additional backup information for you that you need. Um, but this last grant is actually multiple grants. So as you know, we've mentioned it, uh, we have the ADA transition plan. And through the ADA transition plan, we're eligible for grant funding for implementation. Last year we applied for, I think it was $253,000 to make ADA upgrades to uh, two different playgrounds. Um, oh, I'm sorry, did I get to take it out of order? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, we're on the IT grant, I apologize. Uh, so this is the grant that I mentioned that Mike Marina will be applying for. It's another community compact grant. You're allowed to apply for two, which are the two that we just mentioned. Then under IT, you're allowed to apply for one. So we've had two successful grants in the past with them. This would be our third. And Mike is, uh, is in the process of receiving quotes from vendors on the state bid list to uh, upgrade our existing backup storage systems. Again, it's to give us more storage, uh, allow us to keep documents longer, and also to put extra backups in place should anything happen to the main systems. So that's the grant that he would be applying for. I believe the application is due October 15th. Thank you. Do board members have any questions or comments? Seeing none, is there a motion? Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And two minutes. Uh, okay, thank you. And I know Joanna uh, Paquin, the DPW director, is on the line for this. So last year we did apply for the 253,000. We had it was the first round that we were eligible for. So the max, or I'm sorry, 243,000. The max was 250. So we thought, let's go for as much as we can. Uh, we went for two lots, uh, two two playgrounds, the Boy Street Tot Lot and the Franklin Street Playground, and there were a lot of ADA improvements. Our thought was, let's take the transition plan. And implement it and try to do one 
playground at a time as opposed to piecemeal. We did not get the grant, and I had asked to have a meeting with the state to get their feedback as to why we didn't get the grant. What could we do better and what the problem was? So number one, the first problem is there were way more uh, applications than the state had funding for. So the fact that we put in for almost 250000 when that's what they had as a maximum, that amount generally goes to a larger community with a larger population. Um, not always, but generally. So that was the first thing. And also their suggestion to us was to maybe apply for several smaller grants, giving the state the opportunity to kind of pick and choose and say, yeah, we have 20000 for this, we might have 50000 for this, as opposed to we put it all in at once, so it was a all or nothing. So we've divided it up with a couple of the same uh, grant request that we had last time, but we added to it this time the library in Glotted Park to enhance the project that's going on there with the library, the Glotted Park, and the pedestrian bridge. We're going to want to have nice public seatings and pathways that are ADA accessible. This grant would, at 20000 would remove uh, that amount that we would have to do anyway under the, the town funding. Again, freeing up a little bit more if there's an overage maybe on the library or an overage on the Glotted Park. So that was the only new one. The other two we had applied for already, again, just not the entire amount. This is just pieces of it. So DPW did a great job, I leash. Uh, put these grants together. And so the first one for the Boy Street is to provide accessible routes to play areas, increasing the amenity of some of the uh, items there and providing accessible parking spaces. Again, all this comes out of the approved ADA plan. So we're not just making up what needs to be done. This was identified as a need in the plan. Second one is the uh, Franklin Street Playground at 78,570. Again, accessible routes, amenities, and accessible parking spaces. And then the Public Library in Glotted Park. I believe we would have a total of five or six accessible benches and potentially uh, picnic table areas as well, which there is a different accessible picnic table than there would be a standard picnic table. So keeping in mind that we're gonna be doing a great project there, this would really help us. So all three come for hundred Coming to 122, 392, there is no match required. Uh, if we, we had thought at one point there might be a match with this, but it could be in kind, which just means it's the time that we're putting into this, but there's no cash. And at this point, we do not believe there's any in kind match either. Thank you. Do board members have any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. um, related to uh, Franklin Street. So imagine the Accessible park spaces will be added to the section that's uh, off to the right. That's the only parking that there is now that's not street parking for Franklin Park by the basketball courts. Is that uh, through the chair? Can I turn to Joanna sure. Paquin for that? Uh, uh, Joanna, could maybe you can yeah, I don't know. make sure she can hear. Yeah, Joanna, did you hear my question or do you, do you want me to repeat that? Yeah. Okay. I believe that, that we, we wouldn't be creating any additional parking spaces, just making the, the existing parking spaces accessible. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, that was the only question I had since I usually see people at Franklin parking on the street. Um, so I didn't know if we were adding something there on that side. So thank you. All right, that's it. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, is there a motion? I make a motion to authorize, accept, and expend. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Right, moving on to tabled items, we have the wage theft policy or bylaw uh, that I had asked us to talk about at our last meeting uh, and then sent out to members. Amherst bylaw and um, uh, the, I think there was a Worcester ordinance uh, draft bylaw that I had written up and the uh, study done by UMass Amherst related to wage theft. So given that members have had time to look that over, uh, I was hoping to get support to move it to town administration and take the next step moving forward, provided there's support from the rest of the board. So I'll ask you all how you feel at this time. Have my support, Mr. Chair. I agree as well. <laughs> Shocker there. I think I have the 25 year record in dissenting. Um, and it's not really a dissent, I think it is a very important item. Um, I've done some research based on 
my own kind of reasoning, looking at the rules. I asked the manager a bunch of questions as well. Um, you know, most of the communities that have done this are at least 10,000 humans more than us. Their budget's bigger, they have more resources. My concern is resource. My concern is enforcement and who's going to be responsible for it. Um, if we're going to have people send us records, who is going to receive them? Who's going to be responsible for investigating allegations? Um, it, it does seem like the Attorney General's Office and the Division of Labor at the state level are on top of this. They seem to be very good. They have some debarment lists that I've, I've reviewed. Um, but it looks like you got three votes, so I'm not going to uh, waylay the meeting any longer. But those are some of my reservations about adopting it. And I would also, we heard from the trade union, I would think that we should hear from you know, the business community. And there are some bills and have been bills in the last couple of years at the legislative le level, which have not seemingly gotten out of committee, or if they've gotten out, they've you know gone to their watery grave somewhere. Um, they don't seem to have certain things like we have a permanent disbarment. They are contemplating that in any of their bills. And so I would rather work with those folks and try and get some critical mass to get that over the hurdle, because I think it is a statewide issue, not a town issue. Um, but, you know, like I said, you it looks like you have three votes, so it doesn't really matter. Well, your opinion matters. Uh, <laughs> and uh, to that I would say it is a state issue, and I hope the legislature takes action at the state level, uh, as with all things. And even when we discussed the plastic bag ordinance, uh, just hoping that the state legislature would take action on that, but it's been, you know, three years. and. Uh, it really is being done at the municipal level. Uh, with regard to you know wage theft, we're not really putting a policy in place right now. Uh, we don't know what something might look like. Like you said, other the other communities that have implemented it were much larger. Uh, so that's why a bylaw may not be right for us. It might be just a simple policy to include something in our contracts. And I think that uh, that might be acceptable too. I think moving it onto town administration will have a better idea of what, what would be right for Auburn. So uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion to move uh, the wage theft bylaw or wage theft bylaw and or policy proposal to town administration for their review and recommendation. So moved. Second. Um, before I take a vote, I'll just turn to the town manager and ask if that <laughs> motion makes sense. Yeah, I think that does, uh, because that, I, I think what I like that you said is it gives us the opportunity to look at whether it could be just a policy or a bylaw and what the impacts are of either. Um, and with the board's permission, I would have to send this to town council because there are some legal ramifications in this. So I want to make sure that we're covered on the legal end. And, and through the chair, Mr. Carpenter's points were very good. Um, my feeling of, of why I'm supporting this is that if, if, if the state isn't acting, then we could at least shape this in some way, at least on our municipal level. Mm -hmm. so. Through the chair, if I could, uh, Mr. Carpenter had reached out to me with questions, and I agree, he had some excellent questions, and just a couple concerns that we would want to look at before we come back to the board for a vote to move forward on it, and the ones that um, Ms. Carpenter mentioned were ones that you know we had concerns about also, which is enforcement, you know, staffing, how is it enforced? Is it, does it require extra staffing? Is there an extra cost? Does it have any impact on um, any kind of procurement laws that, that we do? Again, these are legal questions. Mm -hmm. And then the just the overall cost of it, and do we have the resources for it? Uh, the good thing is, like you said, we don't have a project right now that this would apply to. Um, we're a couple of years down the road from any major project, if indeed we were to move forward on public safety. So there's time to do it and no time to rush. Um, but certainly, those would be the issues that we want to look at as well. I just want to say there uh, there is state law. They're just trying to amend it, um, and it is being enforced. The, the attorney general and the prior attorney general has been very active in this sphere. She puts out a report every Labor Day, um, and the lists. It's not just that uh, Department of Revenue does it, and the Department of Labor does it. So, I think the state is doing its its best. But you know, as with anything. 
you know, you're trying to control something that is this big and you've got a straw maybe that big. And it's always after the fact, sadly. So these people are going through, you know, tremendous stress and unnecessary worry because of, you know, somebody doing something they should never do. But those are my reservations. But obviously, I think it'll be good to see what comes in. Uh, so a motion has been made and seconded. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 And opposed? I will abstain. Motion passes three with one abstention. Excuse me. Quarter select and member items. We have none. Do members have anything? Seeing none, we have the minutes from August 9th, 2021. <clears throat> Are there any uh, corrections or omissions? Seeing none, I'll accept them as read. Is there anything from anyone in the audience under public comment? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you.